Hey guys, it's Ryan Key from Yellow Card and I'm hanging out with Rob on Front Row Live. Ryan, what's up? It's so good to reunite with you. And before we really dive in and talk about the new music, I got to admit, like this, this tour was such a masterpiece. The entire tour was perfection. Uh, I was at the LA show and from start to finish, I was like, my jaw was on the floor because how good you guys were and just how, uh, you know, it reminded me of growing up listening to Yellow Card all the time. Uh, one of the things that did throw me off from this tour was that you did mention that Part of the reason for the breakup was because you didn't feel the band was where it should have been or you wanted it to be, which was crazy to me because to me, in my eyes, like Yellow Card was one of the biggest bands in the world. And I'm sure some fans could say the same thing. So can you talk to me a little bit or elaborate a little bit more about that topic? Sure. Um, we stepped away from the band in 2008. Um, and in our minds, I think it almost felt as as final as it did. Um, in 2016, for a lot of the same reasons, we had just come off of such an intense high uh, through the Ocean Avenue and, and Lights and Sounds era of the band. And the backslide from that was pretty dramatic and pretty quick. Um, and you couple that with uh, a group of personalities that that probably weren't meant to spend decades of in confinement together, you know, um, we we you know as, as a band I, I think we've all we've been pretty open um just about our journey and, and what we've been through and um we we definitely had um we, we struggled internally um a, a lot throughout basically the entire career of the band until now until this this summer this this sort of awakening reemergence of the band but um i only bring up 2008 because you know, an opportunity or two presented itself uh, two or three years later that brought us back to the band. And right at the beginning, uh, we had some of this same energy where people were really excited about the band coming back and making new music. And so 2011 and 12, I think uh, we really we, we had a lot of success. And I think those records were very well received. But very shortly after that, we started to sort of feel that that backslide. We started to struggle to sell tickets. Uh, we started to feel like um, I mean, a, a lot of factors went into um, the sort of shift sonically that we we took with Lift Sail, um, and then on into the, the the what became you know what we thought was the, the final album. Those records obviously don't they're not pop punk albums. They're not they they're not like Ocean Avenue. They're not like Paper Walls. They're um, they're they're very deliberate in their attempt to explore new avenues and sounds of you know new new musical direction, but that said, it, it definitely didn't really resonate with the listener, right? And we could feel that as well. So we got to a point where the the struggle to, you know, make a living at the level that we aspired to, uh, the seeming sort of lack of interest in the new music that we were making, and the internal sort of personality differences and struggles that can be obviously very common in, in a band of any kind. Um, led us to the decision that it was time to step away from the band for good. I, I don't think we saw any potential to move forward. It, there was there was no, maybe someday this will make sense again. Those conversations never happened. It was like the day the decision was made, we went straight into planning mode for how we put together a final, special, remarkable tour for the fans. Um, to, to say goodbye sort of on our own terms. That's all we ever talked about. We, we never considered doing uh, doing this together again. So the fact that we have been given the opportunity to, to come back and then discovering that it was going to be the, the most successful chapter in the band's history, um, I don't understand it, I guess is the best way to sum it all up. I don't get it. Um, these were the they were the biggest shows we've ever played, uh, you know, headlining on our own, B bigger than even what we were doing in, in 2004. I went back on, you know, setlist.fm or whatever, whichever website to see the venues we played in 2004 on, on the fall tour for Ocean Avenue. And there were a couple of, of amphitheater size, you know, four, four or five thousand capacity rooms. But for the most part, 
it was the same venues we were playing in 2012. It was House of Blues and the Electric Factory in Philly and PlayStation Theater in New York. Um, you know, those those types of venues are what we always played. So, you know, hitting the road with two buses and three semi trucks and video walls and carrying our own production and 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 you know, selling 90 plus percent. I don't know what the final number was, but we were over 90 percent sold out uh, for for the for the whole summer. Um, that's the that that is just by metrics alone so far beyond the most successful thing we've done prior to this um so uh, you know everyone will give you all the reasons why you know there's disposable income and people are older and it's you know they're bringing their kids and they're they're bringing um you know pe the people who were who were too young to go and see us play back then are old enough to come now and you hear all those things and you know there's this moment in time with this resurgence of of uh you know pop punk and and emo music whatever genre you know, whatever genre labels we're going to use for it, but that's all that great. Yes. That's all happening. And I, I hear you when you tell me those things, but that does not, that doesn't like make sense out of our average tickets for the tour being 5,000 people across the 30, some 30 shows or 31 shows or whatever we were at 5,000 was the average. That's like, that's, that's double the size of a house of blues. We've only ever played house of blues, you know? So um, I just don't think all those reasons, while they are definitely factors, equal that result. Like it's still just too many people to make sense of. And and wildly, uh, I would say over half the crowd was was there for their first time. Um, you know, I asked every night of the tour, is it your, you know, raise your hand if it's the first time you're seeing us play. And it was, it felt like the whole venue was, <laughs> it's our first time. Um, so I feel like, there's this sense within the band that we're actually just at the very beginning of something, you know, that this, this could possibly be more than just a moment in time celebrating, you know, the 20th anniversary of Ocean Avenue and um, th those types of things that I think brought the nostalgia factor, I guess we'll call it, that brought people to shows. The fact that so many of people, so many of them were, were there for their first time to me indicates, or at least I hope it indicates that this goes beyond just Ocean Avenue and uh, that people will be excited to continue, uh, you know, to see us from, from here out. I mean, that's something we wanted to accomplish with the tour was just how do we become one of those bands that when you come through town, you go see that band, right? And I mean, we'll never be as big as the Foo Fighters. We'll never be as big as Coldplay. We'll never be as big as some of those bands, but there are, there are, there are bands at this level at that, you know, 5,000 capacity venue uh, that they have that name, that household name where you just go, oh, well, they're coming to town. You know, I'm going to see them. And we lost that. We we, we, we never quite um, fully captured that sentiment with people. Um, so I think that we we hope that all these first time uh, show goers translates into more of, of that, more of like you know, to your point, and I appreciate it, you know, you saying how uh, impressed you were with the show, with how we sounded, with the production and, and all of the elements we brought to the stage on this tour. Um, you know, we were whole, the whole time we're just thinking, we're hoping uh, that all of those things you mentioned uh, make people think differently about the band in a good way, right? It make, makes people uh, feel like this is something they want to be a part of going forward. Right. So I don't know what the future holds. I think if it was over tomorrow, we would all, uh, it would be a very different experience than when it was over in 2016. I think this time we would all shake hands and hug each other and talk about how grateful we were for this opportunity we got this summer. Uh, but thankfully I, that's not the case. And it looks like we're good. We've got a lot more gas in the tank. And that's the exciting part. Uh, the, those little teases you kept saying during the show of like, we're back, we're doing more, who wants to see more? Like, all of that stuff got me even more excited um, and, you know, looking forward to this future with Yellow Card. But as we, you know, leading up to this tour, you had already announced this EP. You had already dropped the the single of the EP. And the fact that you went through those experiences with the previous music and, you know, it must be kind of nerve wracking to bring new music again all over again. So um, talk to me about Childhood Eyes and like that initial step of like starting to write the new music like was that nerve-wracking uh knowing that you were gonna start the band all over again 
It's funny because it really wasn't. I think the lack of pressure with this whole thing, because it was all so unexpected and we're from the beginning of you're going to be playing in amphitheaters. When that conversation started, we've all sort of just been like, okay, sure. If you say so, like, <laughs> believe it when I see it, you know, kind of thing. And uh, obviously we were very happily uh, proven, our, our doubts were proven wrong in, in the best way. Uh, but the music was kind of the same thing. It was like, whatever happens with it doesn't really matter. So let's just make it. I mean, it doesn't have to be on the radio. It doesn't have to, it would be cool if it, if it, you know, captivates people again in a, in a meaningful way. But if it doesn't, it doesn't, I don't know. There's just a different attitude. There's a different vibe. There's a different energy in the band. I think where we are able to make decisions that are, you know, not, solely financially motivated now because we've just had we, we we have these incredible opportunities that are allowing us to like take our time a little bit and and make you know because maybe a little taboo to talk about but like we are trying to make a living and provide for our families and stuff when we do this right so when you're in a, a, a stressful financial chapter uh as an artist as a band i guess as any business you can make decisions that are not right for what you're doing because you 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 have to do it. Well, we have to do it because we have to, we just have to take that show or we have to take that opportunity because we need the money. We ha are now for the first time in 20 years in a place where we can come home and relax for a minute and, you know, carefully decide what our next move is to, to perpetuate this success, to keep this level of, of uh, opportunity and success going moving forward. So the, the record was, very similar in that like we didn't need to make it uh for any type of reason other than just recording songs that was we just wanted it, i think it was more about getting the four of us in a room together and like working on our relationships uh, as friends and colleagues and rebuilding uh, together in a in a constructive and healthy way than it was about releasing music um, I, I think it was a huge step forward being creative together again, uh, listening to each other's opinions and thoughts when they agreed or disagreed with a choice being made. And uh, as opposed to, you know, days gone by getting upset or having having arguments, you know, feeling this tension, there was this openness and this level of communication and uh empathy and and all all these things that that made this process more about building uh or rebuilding relationships to prepare us for the tour and for everything that comes next than it was about you know the songs performing in any way um so i think we were able to capture this sort of core yellow card sound which we haven't done in in many years we haven't really gone after the 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 sonic direction that, you know, made people fall in love with yellow card 20 years ago. That's not something we've creatively uh, tried to do in a long time. And I think the fact that we took so many years away from doing more pop punk leaning music made the challenge of doing it again, very authentic and real, as opposed to just like chasing the sound of ocean Avenue. Right. Because how do you make music, that you made when you are 23, when you're 43, without sounding like you're just absolutely forcing it and faking it, you know? So we didn't, we, we all, we didn't say, let's make this sound like Ocean Avenue. We, we used, um, the, the mindset we were in was more about what do we make to just get people excited about Yellow Card again? And I think we inherently know without saying it out loud that that style of Yellow Card is what gets people excited about yellow card uh we went through the experience of lift of sale and the self-titled album and when we really take took those risks which were great for us and i think improved us as artists and songwriters in in in, a, in tangible ways because we really pushed our own boundaries as songwriters and, and as artists on those two records um but i think that allowed us to come back to this again this like core sound um with just an empty canvas and like no no pressure no um it was fun. The challenge, the challenge of creating that sound again was really fun for us. And I think it's been a long time. Um, I don't think I know it's been a long time since we've had fun as a band. And I love that you brought Neil Avron back to this. I mean, he's mm -hmm. been with you guys since early on and, and obviously part of ocean Avenue era as well. So the fact that there's been that gap, uh, and now you guys are back together in the studio 
recording this EP. How did he, how did you guys come back together? Was it just like, as if it was yesterday when the last time you guys collaborated with him, or did you feel like you guys had to get comfortable with him all over again? Well, Neil doesn't produce anymore, really. Um, you know, he he did the newest Fall Out Boy record, Totally in the Dark, and no one knew he was doing it. And we were like, what? What are you doing producing a whole album? You don't do that anymore. <laughs> um, so the last full-length album he produced for us was Lift to Sail in, in 2014. And um, he uh, executive produced the final album. So he was involved in, you know, we sent him demos and he uh, helped us with his, you know, thoughts and constructive criticism on a part or an idea that maybe this is better than that. Or, um, so having his mind involved has never left the band, you know, having his, his touch on the songs has never left, but he hasn't like been in the room producing the band, uh, since, since 2014. So, um, I basically just reached out to him and said, Hey, I know you're not producing anymore, but, um, no one can get the, the vocal performance out of me that you can. So if we can make it work, it's, you know, it's only five songs. Uh, if we can make it work, I, I, it would just mean the world to, to me if we could, if I could come and do the vocals with you. So that he, I went uh, to LA and I recorded the vocals. It was, it was pretty stressful because I, I, it ended up being fine, but going into it, I was, I was really nervous because I had five songs to do in five days. I had like mo Monday through Friday with Neil and I had to track all five of them. So if I had gone too hard on a certain track and lost my voice for the next day, we would have been in, we would have in trouble, but it, it ended up working out great. But um, so Neil produced the vocals and um, I, I mean, it's true. I, I believe that the record wouldn't be as good if I had done it myself or, you know, if Ryan Mendez and I had produced the vocals ourselves, like we, we typically would do nowadays. Um, and uh, and he mixed the record too and i think that's when you're really going to get into like wanting it to sound like yellow card having neil mix the songs is what's most important because you know he takes the what we've what we've given him and just levels it up beyond measure you also brought in uh two amazing collaborations you could have picked anyone in the world to collaborate on mm -hmm. this record and you brought vic fuentes from pierce the veil and you brought chris caraba from dashboard and they both did such an incredible job. What was it about them that you wanted them to be part of this EP instead of it just being a yellow card EP? Well, we talked about having some collaborations on the record, which is not something we've done much of in, in our discography. We do have some songs where we had people come in and guest feature, but um, but we haven't done very much of it. We felt like if we could get the right people, it would genuinely just help with the exposure of the record. It would get you know people who haven't, listen to the band in a long time or, you know, th there are still many, many, many people in the world that have no idea that we are, you know, anything past 2004 when they heard us on the radio. And, and that was a thing, you know, so um, getting, getting people uh, that might be like, whoa, get yellow card. That's still a band, you know, that happens. And it's exciting because if, you know, if you make the right music and people hear it, they're going to get pumped and they're going to want to be involved in what you're doing. So um, Vic was, was, totally not planned uh he and i were just texting uh I, I reached out to him to tell him how rad i thought their new record was and the conversation just evolved and i was like you know what we're trying to look for people to maybe jump on this ep i don't know if it's something you you know i know you don't do a lot of guest vocals but what do you think and he was like absolutely send me the demos let me let see if i vibe with any of the songs and so i did and and he immediately came back and wanted to do three minutes more um i had like vocal demos at that point of all the songs um so that was killer i got i went to san diego and and recorded his vocals with him um what a, what a what a dude he's just he's such a good person man he's such a kind um happy positive energy to be around and i am trying to have more of that in my life at this you know this phase of my life um so really, really grateful that he he was involved and 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 was so excited about the project. And then Chris was more deliberate in that I knew we all, we, we all wanted to do an acoustic song on the record again, kind of getting after that core yellow card experience. I think the acoustic songs have always been a big part of what we've done. Um, Sean's composition in the strings and all those things, you know, it's it's always been a big part of our music. So we knew we wanted an acoustic song. Um, I had that song laying around uh, for years. The most of the vocals, with the exception of some of the verse stuff, are, are vocals I recorded at home in 2015 on the places we'll go. 
Uh, so I didn't update them or refresh them. I just that they were just on the EP from eight, you know eight years ago. Um, but I knew if we were doing an acoustic song that I wanted to ask Chris if he you know if he would be interested in, in singing on it. So um, because I already had that song sitting around as as a sort of realized recording for so you know I just um, once the band once Josh and Ryan and Sean sort of greenlit yeah let's use that song because that's a tricky thing too you know I I never. I write the lyrics and melody for the band, but I never want to be overbearing and come in and be like, I have this whole song done and there's no input. And, and with this particular song, it was very much like done. So, uh, you know, and, and the appeal of it was sort of like, Hey, this already sounds great. I think the guitars sound good. The vocals sound good. We can basically use this as is, and it'll save us so much time, you know, on the recording and everything else. So when they all said, yes, this is a great song. Let's use it. We're on board. Uh, next stop was sending the demo to Chris and saying, Hey, would you be interested in singing on this? And he same, same energy as Vic, as far as he was immediately like, yes, whatever you need, I want to be a part of it. Um, and also same energy as Vic, literally he's that kind of person as well. He is such a warm, uh, supportive, kind human being. And like my time away from yellow card in Nashville, uh, I was there for, you know, the last seven years until I moved to Florida last year. And Chris and I really became friends during that time more than we ever had before. And he was just such a, uh, just an invaluable resource for me when I was trying to go it alone, because that's what he, you know, he's a, and for all intents and purposes, a, a solo artist, right? So he had just so much advice for me, was so supportive on the days where I just wanted to, to bail because it's hard, it's, it's hard. Music is hard you know, and, and I would, we'd be out, you know, with friends and he could tell that I was just struggling and he would just always be there for me to say, you know, just keep, keep going, dude, one foot in front of the other. You're doing, you know, you're doing what you love. And if you just see it through, like stay the course, you know, you're, you're going to be okay. And funnily, f funny enough too, he was always very much an advocate for like, you're going to do yellow card again. Right. And I was like, I would always just be like, no, dude, there's no way I can, I can tell you with certainty, there's no chance that we're ever going to do yellow card again. Um, and that's that's genuinely how it felt for us. And Chris was always in, in the wings. Like we'll, we'll see about that. We'll see about that. He was just always such an advocate for us getting back together. So, um, you know, good on him for, for seeing the future the way he did. What, what an amazing kind of team that you, start to build with like other band members or other bandmates like that's really cool because especially you know everybody's a fan of your band and whether you realize it or not uh i feel like there's a lot of bands today that are here because of yellow card um mm -hmm. so which is such an incredible feeling uh now to close this off because i know you got to run but to close this off i want to talk uh about ocean avenue the recording and the writing process of ocean avenue since it is the 20th um year of of this release so during that process, what would you say was like that biggest challenge that you had in order to create this album? Um, well, the learning curve was really steep. Um, it's the first time we'd ever worked with a, with a producer like Neil, who um, really came in and was like, that's not how you do this, you know? And look, there's no rules. You can do whatever you want in music, right? But I think he could sense that we had a pop, songwriting sensibility you know when and when i say pop like that word is very broad i don't mean we were trying to be you know like a four on the floor electronic pop artist as you would probably categorize that word today but just the sensibility of writing popular songs right writing songs that really resonated with a lot of people in a big way he i think he could feel that in us but we had no idea how to properly capture that energy in that direction our songs were all over the place it would be like verse then like random instrumental section then what would have been a bridge and then back to a verse like no songs with three choruses which again there's no rules but look at every for the most part every massive popular song in history has somewhat of a for lack of a better word formula to the way it's written and we didn't know that formula we didn't know how to use it and that's the thing is just because it has a formula doesn't mean it's a bad thing. If you have the right person teaching you how to use the formula, you're going to get great results, right? And so Neil taught us really that, you know, the the art of putting together a, a proper pop rock song. And we learned so much in that, you know, 12-week period of working with him, making the album. Um, 
it was intimidating. It was exciting. As far as like the biggest challenge, I mean, it's hard to put it, you know, obviously also 20 years have gone by and my brain is old. So it's hard to think of like a, like a broad sort of sweeping challenge because I, I don't, I don't think it, I think we were excited and having a lot of fun. So it was, it didn't feel overbearing or stressful in, in any way, but, uh, but I will say, and this story is out there in the world. So most people, you know, that know the band know it, but Ocean Avenue, the song almost didn't go on the album because I would say my, my biggest challenge personally was finishing the chorus of that song. I could not come up with anything that Neil kind of signed off on. Right. And you know, again, it's, it's your record. You can do whatever you want. Right. Like there, there's this whole, I mean, back then, you know, we were coming out of like garage band shows playing in storage units and, you know, like, so the whole concept of having a producer and, and that, that person being able to make decisions that affect your songwriting, that was super taboo, it was super not rock and roll, not punk rock, not, you know what I mean? But you meet someone like Neil and you realize that these are the minds behind these earth shattering globe, you know, influencing global influencing artists throughout the decades. It's they, there is a producer. There is someone that is able to harness the creative energy of, of the artist and, and focus it and make these incredible recordings. And Neil is that kind of producer. Um, so I, I, that said, I would come in. What about this? What about this? I mean, just was always like, I think you can do better. That's Neil's MO. I think you can do better. Uh, and what a great thing, you know, what a great way to inspire a young artist. He, he's kind, he's encouraging, he doesn't yell. He, there are, produ you know, there are rock producers that get all up in your face and make you cry if you can't play a guitar part, right? I've heard stories. Neil is not that kind of producer. He's, he is an inspirational, he, he wants to, he wants to inspire you and encourage you to really do your best. And so that's, a, that's a, you know, the sentiment behind his production style is I just, I think you can do better. And then you hit that one thing and he goes, see, I told you. I told you you could do it. And I just finally walked in there and brought him, you know, saying him, if I could find you now, things would get better. And he just pointed at me and said, get in there and track that. That's it. You did it. And we were like a week and a half away from the end of this recording session. And back, you know, when when you're in a session like that, you're done. You have to leave. You're you're in a you're, you know, you're in a room that's like blocked out for a certain amount of time amount of time, and another artist is coming in when you're done. So it's not like today where you can go home to my studio and do some overdubs or fix something if I need to, or we didn't have that capability back then. So we were up against the clock as far as finishing the album in general. Um, and I didn't have a chorus for that song until the very, very end. And what a different story we would be telling, right? If that was a B-side that I finished later, you know? Insane. That was, you know, yeah. that was, that was the song. That was everything. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome, Ryan. Well, again, it's so good to reunite with you. I can talk to you forever. But um, thank you for hanging out with me. I look forward to more with you and Yellow Card. And um, yeah, thanks, man. Thanks so much for this record. Thank you so much for this tour. Of course, dude. Uh, I'm also looking forward to it. I really am. A, it's it's so up in the air right now as far as what's going to happen and where we're going to go. I mean, the the phone calls that are coming in are just, dude, dude there's some crazy shit happening. Like, <laughs> It, I believe there, there are some crazy shit, dude. We we are all just in disbelief at all of this, <laughs> and it's it's bleeding into next year already, big time. So, um, we'll see where it goes.